Right, uh, good morning, everyone. I uploaded uh, your first coursework on Friday, and almost half the students have attended the laboratory sessions. Before I carry on with uh, chapter four, are there any questions? No questions. So I started uh, chapter four last week, which is uh, based on uh, theories of uh, bending, uh, sorry, theories of torsion. And I uh, finished uh, the first uh, part of uh, this chapter, which involves analysis of circular cylinders subject to a torque. The circular cylinder could be solid, hollow, or a thin wall with uniform uh, thickness. Now, before I move on to the second uh, part of this chapter, which involves analysis of a uh, thin walled section subject to torsion, I briefly go through the, some of the slides I showed you last week, and then we move on to the remaining part, uh, slides of this chapter. When a circular cylinder, which is a fixed at one end and subject to a torque at the other end, the torque, the effects of the torque are to impart shearing stresses on the cross section, which are normal to the axis of the cylinder, and also rotation or angle of twist or twisting of one end of the cylinder with respect to the other end. So in terms of stress, the effects are shearing stresses. In terms of deformation is angular deformation or angle of twist. On the slide number five, I showed you based on equilibrium by equating the external torque to the resisting torque from the material, I showed you these two equations. The first one gives us the angle of twist in radians, which is equal to the torque applied, the length of the cylinder divided by the product of G, the shear modulus, and a polar second moment of area of the cross section. The product of G and J is called a torsional stiffness or torsional rigidity. It has an element of material property shear modulus and an element of the geometry, the shape of or dimensions of the cylinder. So the higher this value, this product is, uh, the lower the angle of twist is and vice versa. So it identifies this product, identifies the stiffness of the cylinder. I also show you that the shear stress on the cross section is equal to the torque applied the radius of any point, any fiber from the center of the twist or center of the cylinder divided by the polar second moment of area. So based on this equation, shear stress has a linear variation. It has a maximum value on the outer layer and it has zero value at the center. G is the polar second moment of area which we covered on in chapter three, for a solid cylinder is equal to pi, fourth power of diameter divided by 32. Now the equations, this J, I mean, these two equations are also applicable to a hollow cylinder. The only difference is the definition of J. In this case, pi over 32 multiplied by fourth power of outer diameter minus a fourth power of inner diameter. Now, they, we found these two equations based on equilibrium and based on these two assumptions that all the planar sections remain planar after the applied torque and the circular sections remain circular. So the deformation is very, very small. So there is no warping displacement. The cross-section remains normal to the axis of cylinder when the torque is applied. The material being linear elastic, isotropic, and homogeneous is 
the assumption uh, throughout this course. On slide number six, you see the units of each variable used uh, throughout the analysis. The only thing which is new to you is the unit of angle of twist. If you substitute the units of T, L, G, and J, you can see theta has no unit. Therefore, its units must be radians, not degrees. And also, in engineering, instead of angle of twist, we usually use the rate of twist, and that's the angle of twist per unit length of the cylinder. In majority in industry, usually per meter length. So this is either we use a theta over L, and in future slides, I also show you that you can use d theta over dz. So what I showed you, the two equations I showed you, we found them on a, on a slide a number five based on equilibrium, equating the external torque and the resisting torque from the material. Now, if you move on to a slide a number eight, I show you we can find this equation based on the law of conservation of energy. So this diagram shows us the torque angle of twist response. So the area under this curve is the work done by the torque. Assuming material has linear elastic behavior. The material is subject to shear stress. Therefore, based on the shear stress, a shear strain, the area under this curve gives us the strain energy stored per unit volume of the cylinder. But because shear stress has linear variation, we are not allowed to multiply as literally the energy stored per unit volume by the volume, because as you can see, the shear stress is not uniformly distributed. So therefore, we need to find the volume integral of this term over the cylinder. But because we assume the cross-sectional area is uniform along the length, therefore, you can find and convert this uh, triple integral, you can convert it to a double integral, and then from there, by equating the work done and the energy stored, this is the energy stored, equating these two, you can find the angle of twist. So I repeat, whatever I, we see on a slide number eight are based on the law of conservation of energy, equating the work done and energy stored. On the slide five, we found the same equation based on the equilibrium equation. On the slide number nine, you see a thin walled circular cylinder. But on the slide number nine, the, th the thickness is the uniform, is not variable. So we still can use the two equations I showed you on the slide five. The only difference is that because the section is very thin, we can make some approximation for calculation of the polar second moment of area. So the equations on the left-hand side, when we have the exact value for J, on the right-hand side are the approximate value for J. When the thickness is very small, the two values are almost the same. I saw that example for you and showed you the results of using two different sets of equations. So if the thickness is as small and I apply a torque, the shear stress on the previous slides has had a linear variation. But because it's very, very thin, the through thickness variation of shear stress can be ignored. Therefore, we only have one arrow to show the shear stress. So we only have one value for shear stress because it's very thin. Based on this approximation, I showed you that the torque applied, we can still use this equation if the thickness is uniform, but we can also use this relation because based on this assumption, we can say the torque applied is equal to two times the area enclosed by the perimeter of the section multiplied by the product of the thickness and the shear stress. By definition, the product of the thickness and shear stress is called a shear flow. And for thin sections, it's more convenient to use shear flow rather than shear stress. 
And what's the definition of shear flow? Shear flow is the force applied per unit length of the structure. So A, I mean, two is the shear force applied per unit area of the section. So then the section is a thick or solid, we usually use a two. When the section is a thin, it's better to use a Q. It makes our analysis much easier. So the unit of Q is either Newton per millimeter or Newton per meter. So this is what was covered on a slide number nine. It is a transition between what you learn in the first part of this chapter and the second part of this chapter. And the arrows you can see, so when I apply a torque here, we, based on this equation, A is constant, which is the area enclosed by the perimeter, therefore Q is constant. So you can see I've shown you by small arrows around this section. Those arrows must have been located on the section, but because it's very thin, I have put them on the side. So this is a shear flow applied on the section, and because A is constant, therefore, if I apply it to the outcome, is a constant shear flow around the section. Now we move on to a slide number 10, torsion of thin closed tube. So in this section, you can see that the section has an arbitrary shape. It could be single cell, it could be multi-cell. We could have sharp corners as well, so it doesn't need to be continuous or a smooth surface. So we can see we have discontinuity at these two locations. So the shape is arbitrary, and also we allow the thickness to vary. So when we'll be analyzing a thin walled circular cylinder based on the two equations, the thickness was uniform around the section. Here we allow the thickness to vary as well. So the shape is arbitrary. The thickness is allowed to vary around the section. We also let the material property be different. So sometimes, for example, in this wing section, we could have titanium used for the vertical walls, we could have aluminium used for the outer section. So we could have a combination of materials. So the assumptions here are completely different with the assumptions we had in section one. So therefore we come up with different sets of equations. Now I tell you, I'm going to show you a lot of equations here. They might look complicated, but in terms of application, they're quite a straightforward. 95% of the students do very well in this chapter. It might look to you, because you're looking at them for the first time, they're complicated, but I assure you they're not. When we apply and solve a few, exam I solve a few examples for you. So the first assumption, the cross-section is arbitrary. The thickness is allowed to vary. We could have variable thicknesses. This is the same assumption I made when we be, I showed you in slide number nine. Through thickness variation of shear stress in this part can be ignored. Therefore, we just show the shear stress by one arrow. So this arrow is actually on the section, which I've shown you on the side of the section. So we have no variation of the shear stress, like linear variation for a circular cylinder thin or, sorry, thick or solid. So we only have one shear stress value at each position of the section. And as I said earlier, we could have different materials around the section. Now, based on these assumptions, we serve the analysis of a single cell tube subject to torsion, and using the same equation, we expand it to multi-cell we apply compatibility equation to find other equations to find the angle of twist and the shear stress for the multi-cell tube. So I start with a single cell tube. So as I said, the shape is arbitrary, but it has a, it has a uniform cross-sectional area along its length. So this is a tube of arbitrary shape. I've attached XYZ coordinate system to the cross-section. 
C is the center of twist, something we are going to, I'm going to cover in chapter six. Center of twist or shear center. And because it is a thing, it's more convenient to use a curvilinear coordinate system because the section is a thing. So the curvilinear coordinate system is one dimensional and the coordinate of any point, but it is curvilinear. It's not a straight like an X and Y axis. So the coordinate of any point is just the distance from the origin on the curved path. So this is what we call coordinate of a point on the section in the curvilinear coordinate system. Now, if the section has no axis of symmetry, then you can place the origin of the curvilinear coordinate system wherever you want. It doesn't make any difference. If you have one axis of symmetry or two axes of symmetries, it's better to put the origin on the axis of symmetry. It makes your analysis easier. However, if there is no axis of symmetry for a closed section, you can place it anywhere. So this tube at the moment is fixed at one end and is subject to a torque at the other end. Now I'm looking at a tiny element selected from the wall of this tube. So I take this element and look at it, have a close up view of this element. Now this element has a dimensions of delta Z and delta S. So delta Z, we call it delta, usually in mathematics, we call it final difference. So when we say delta Z, it could be one centimeter, two centimeters, and the same as delta S. So this is delta Z, which is along the length of the cylinder. As you can see, Z is along the axis. So this is along this, so this is delta Z, and this is delta S along the curvilinear coordinate system. Now, we allowed the thickness to vary. So if thickness on one side is T, on the other side, either is a bit smaller or a bit bigger. So I say the other side is a slightly bigger. It doesn't make any difference if it's smaller or bigger. So delta T has got a hidden sign in it. Now, when we apply talk, similar to what you learned in chapter, in section one of this chapter, talk implies, applies a shear stress on the cross section. So therefore, if the shear stress here, we've got shear stress on these two planes, we must have shear stresses on these two planes as well. I showed you last week, and also in chapter one, that shear stress is always complementary. Whenever we have shear stress on a plane, we have it on another plane normal to the first one. So this is coming because of the characteristics of a shear stress being complementary. Now say the shear stress applied here is two, because the thickness is varying, therefore the shear stress on the top cannot be the same as the bottom one. Because if the thickness was uniform, yes, the top one would have been the same as bottom one. Because the thickness is varying, the top one must be a bit smaller or bigger. So I've added the derivative of the thickness, uh, sorry, the shear stress with respect to S, and then multiplied it by the differential of delta S. So this is derivative of two D shear stress with respect to S, and this is the final difference of delta S. Now this element is in equilibrium. In that case, the forces applied in the z direction must be equal to zero. So summation of the forces in the z direction must be equal to zero. Now look at the z direction. We've got a shear stress acting on this plane, plane of T times delta z, and we've got a shear stress of this shear stress acting on this plane, which is T plus delta T multiplied by delta z. So what was the definition of the stress? Force divided by the area. And finding the summation of the forces, so force is equal to stress multiplied by the area it is applied to. So therefore, for the bottom edge, 
For the bottom plane, I can say the shear stress multiplied by the area applied to gives me a force applied to the left. On the top one, this is the stress. I multiply it by this area. It gives me the force applied to the right. Now, on both sides, you see the differential of delta Z. So we can eliminate delta Z from both sides. And then I multiply the two values of the two brackets. So delta Z is eliminated. I multiply the remaining terms. Now, these two are equal, so they can be canceled out. These two is a product of two very, very small values. It's like one millimeter by one millimeter. One times 10 to the power of minus three by 10 to the power of minus three gives you 10 to the power of minus six. So this gives us, this product is a very small value. It's an infinitesimal value. We can ignore it because it's a product of two small values. Now I'm going to rearrange the equations so I divide both sides by delta S. So we have delta T over delta S. Now if delta S is a very small value, I can say D delta T over delta S is equal to DT over DS. So I can convert these two final differences to a differential. So these two are going to be eliminated. So delta T over delta S provided delta S is very small, can be converted to dt over ds. Now from your mathematics, what was this called? Do you agree this is equal to the differential of or derivative of the product of t and two with respect to s? So if I have the derivative of this product with ds, I end up with this relation. Now, what was the product of T and 2 called from chapter 9? Sure. Well done. So the product of the T and 2 is called shear flow. So it means, based on this equation, dQ over dS is equal to 0. Now, if the derivative of a function with respect to a variable is equal to 0, it means that function must be a constant value based on what you already know from mathematics. So it means if I apply a torque to a single cell tube, regardless of its shape, the, the torque imparts a constant shear flow around the section. So the only assumption is that the section is single cell. So if I apply torque, I repeat, regardless of its shape, the outcome is a constant shear flow around the section. And what was Q is the product of the thickness and the shear stress, or the force applied per unit, a length of the cross section. Any questions on the slide number 11? On this line at number 11, I showed you that Q is constant for a single cell when it's subject to a torque. But we need to find a relation between the torque applied and the shear flow. Excuse me, if you are answering phone, could you go outside, please? Okay. So we move on to a slide number 12. So this is what we discovered on the slide 11. If I apply torque, the outcome is a constant shear flow around the section, regardless of its shape. Now the next, is it outside or is it inside? Now wait, this, I think I'm going to ask something about uh, arbitrary shapes. Yes. So without any axes of symmetry, it would be far better to put C on the central, right? On the center? The centroid of the shape, the very center of the shape. Oh, no, 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 no. 
ignore the centroid at the moment. Just leave. No, 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 no. It has to be located. The centroid of this is not located at, on the section. It's located inside it. But the curvilinear coordinate system, the origin, must be located on the section. Yes, but so the origin can be put anywhere if there are no origins. Yes, you can put it anywhere on the section, but not inside the section. Okay. So the next, the next step is to find a direct relation between the torque applied and the shear flow, which is constant around the section. So this is the torque. And I, we established that around this section, we have a she, constant shear flow applied. So I'm looking at a tiny element on this section with the length of ds. And the shear flow in that tiny element is q. So if I multiply q by ds, it gives me a force. Excuse me, could you do me a favor? Could you go outside and tell someone who we're talking there? Thank you, thank you very much. So if we have a shear, constant shear flow around the section, we are looking at an element on the section with the length of ds. So if I multiply q by ds, it gives us a shear force applied to this tiny element. Now this shear force is applied at the normal distance of r from the center of twist, which r is a variable. If you have printed your notes, if you have iPad, right R is not a constant value. If you have a circular section, obviously, R is a constant value. If you don't have a circular section, R is variable. So this shear force applied to this element is at a normal distance of R from the center of twist, where the torque is applied. So if I multiply by R, it gives me a tiny torque from the material resistance from the material. And if I add all these values for each of, if I divide the whole cross section to a small element such as the S, each one of them has a resistant torque. Well, another way I can say that if I find the loop integral of this term around this section, this must be equal to the torque applied externally. Now, Q is constant. It can be extracted from the integral. So what is a loop integral of RDS? Look at this pink triangle. With the base of DS, with the base of DS and the normal distance of R, do you agree that the area of this a pink triangle is equal to R times ds divided by 2? Or I can say R ds is equal to 2 times a dA. It means the loop integral of R ds is a twice the area enclosed by the perimeter of the section. So I can say the torque applied is equal to two times A, which is the area enclosed by the perimeter, multiplied by shear flow. And I showed you the same equation on slide number nine for a thin walled cylinder with a uniform thickness. So we have exactly the same equation, but here the thickness is variable, the shape is arbitrary, and we can just say here, A is not the cross-sectional area of the cylinder, is the area enclosed by the perimeter. So could you please highlight it or write it here? A few students make this mistake in exam. 
So from slide 11, you found that if I apply a torque to a single cell tube, the outcome is a constant shear flow. On slide 12, I showed you the torque applied is equal to two times the area enclosed by the perimeter multiplied by the shear flow. Excuse me, could you stop talking, please? Any question in relation to this slide, please? Okay. So I'm going based on slides 11 and 12. I'm going to solve part of question 11 for you. In, 11, in question 11, we've got a simplified version of a wing section, a single cell. The dimensions are given. It has variable thickness and is subject to a torque of 10 kilonewton meters. The problem is asking us to find the shear stress in each thickness. So in that case, the equation we have is T, the torque applied, equal to two times the area enclosed by the perimeter multiplied by the shear flow. A is the area enclosed by the perimeter. So we have here half a circle. We've got a rectangle and we've got a triangle. So that is the area enclosed by the perimeter, not the cross-sectional area. Half a circle, rectangle, and the triangle. So this is the area. So Q is equal to 10 kilonewton meters. So we've got Sorry, 100 kilonewton meters. So I converted it to newton millimeters. That is the area in millimeters squared. So the outcome Q is the shear flow of 75.43 newton per millimeter. So Q is constant. But the problem is asking us to find the shear stress in each thickness. We've got a thickness of a 0.4 millimeters and we've got a thickness of a 4.8 millimeters. So which one is subject to a higher shear stress, the thinner one or a thicker one? If the shear stress is the product of the thickness and the shear stress. So Q is the product of the shear stress and the thickness. Q is constant. So which one is subject to a higher stress value, the thinner one or a thicker one? How many of you think it's a thinner one? How many of you think it's a thicker one is subject to higher shear stress? Okay. So you are right. Uh, the thinner one is subject to higher shear stress value. So what I do here, I divide a Q by the thickness of 0.8. It gives me 94.3 megapascals. And for the thickness of 0.4 millimeters, it gives me 188.6 megapascals. Now, if in exam you had a single cell and you were asked to find the maximum shear stress, just go for the thinner section, part of the section, and find their values. You need to do for the whole section. But here I was asked to find an inch a thickness. Any question related to a slide 11? So we move on to the next slide, if you have no questions. Yes, please. Yes. For a single cell, if you have the value of Q, you divide it by the thickness, gives you the shear stress. Does it make sense? Okay.
So if we move on to the next slide, it's slide number 30. So we, now we have an equation to find the shear stress. The next stage is a finding a relation between the torque applied and angle of twist. Now, I'm not going to use the equilibrium method. If you refer to Mexon, it uses equilibrium to find the angle of twist. So this is much easier for us to find it based on the law of conservation of energy. So this is a single cell. It's subject to a torque. I've attached a curvilinear coordinate system at any point on this section. And this is what I've borrowed from a chapter one. If you had a component with subject to shear stress, therefore, from the shear stress, a shear strain diagram, we can say this is the strain energy stored per unit volume. But if the thickness is variable, shear stress is varying, therefore, I cannot multiply it by the volume. If it was constant around the section, yes. But at the moment, I can't. However, I can say the work done is equal to, the, from the torque, angle of twist response, I can say it's equal to, to torque applied, maximum angle of twist divided by two. And I showed you that T is equal to 2A cubed. So if I substitute in this equation, I can say the work done is equal to A cubed theta. Is A the cross-sectional area or A area enclosed by the perimeter of the section? Perimeter, raise your hand, area, okay, very good. So it's not the cross-sectional area. Now this equation is valid. And I can say the, shear, the strain energy stored per unit volume is equal to 12 squared divided by 2G. Now the next stage is find the volume integral of this term and equating it with the top equation to find the angle of twist. So I substitute the value of instead of two I use Q. Now this is the volume integral over the cylinder. So if I use a dV which is the product of dx d by dz, I use just one single integral sign. If I divide dV to two elements, such as dA, the area, and dz, which is the length. Now, because this is a thin section, I can say dA is equal to T times a dS. So dA is a small element on the cross section. Because it is thin, I can say in the curvilinear coordinate system, dA is equal to T times a dS. So a triple integral can be converted to a single integral. So first I converted it to double integral, and now I'm converting it to a single integral. But look at the loop integral. If I'm using the curvilinear coordinate system, I start from a point on the section and I, because the closed section, single cell, I end up at the same position. So therefore, in this equation here, we have a loop integral. It's not an open section, it's a closed section. So therefore, if I convert this triple integral to a double integral, then to a single integral, I end up with this loop integral. So the bottom equation gives us, gives us the total energy stored which is coming from this equation here. And this is coming from the torque angle of twist response. Now I'm going to equate these two. So what you see on the slide number 14 is the continuation of the slide number 13. I'm going to equate these two, term, these two terms. Any question on the slide number 13? Yes, please. Uh, sorry, did you say the This, this DA. Uh, okay, DA on the work done, sorry. This one. Yeah. This, um, that is actually is a very, very good question. This A is not the same as this A here. This A is the area enclosed by the perimeter. 
But this dA is coming from this differential, which is dx dy dz. This dA here is dx dy. So this A here, that is a good question, is the area enclosed by the perimeter, but this dA, differential of A here, is the differential of the cross-sectional area. So please write down, these two are not the same. Now I'm going to equate these two terms. Right, my apology. So here we've got the work done by the extent of torque, and this is the string energy stored. I'm going to equate these two on the next slide. So the energy is stored. The work done. Now Q is constant, we can eliminate one from each side. So this is the outcome. The angle of twist is equal to Q, the shear flare, multiplied by the length of the cylinder, divided by two times the area enclosed by the perimeter, multiplied by the loop integral of ds over gt. Now, please write next to GT. It remains inside the integral. And the reason is that we allowed the thickness to vary, and we allowed the material property to vary as well. So in this equation, GT remains inside the integral. Now, this is the angle of twist. If you're after the rate of twist, I divide both sides by the length of the cylinder, Or in this one, I have written it in terms of T as well. Sometimes the student use this equation. So Q is equal to T divided by 2A. So I've written the same equation in terms of the torque. And then I divide both sides by the length. And it gives me the rate of twist. Now in the book by Maxson, in majority of pages, it uses D theta over DZ rather than theta over L. In some books, they write a theta over L. So I repeat, theta over L is the rate of twist. In some books, they use a V theta over DZ, and in some books, they use a theta over L. I repeat, in Maxson, aircraft structures by Maxson, in majority of pages, it uses the theta over DZ. They both have the same meaning. So I repeat, A is the area enclosed by the perimeter. This is a loop integral of dS divided by GT, and GT remains inside the integral. Now, when you're finding the total energy stored, my advice to you is to use the last equation on this slide, T times a theta over two. You can use this equation but it's time consuming. You said you get exactly the same answer. In exam, I'm afraid some students go for this equation. It's just time consuming, finding the strain energy stored using the top equation. It's a, it is not wrong, it's absolutely correct. It just takes longer for you to find the energy stored. So if you have the torque applied, if you have the angle of twist, T times a theta divided by two gives you the 
works on or the energy is stored. Now on slide number 15, after I solve a couple of examples for you, I show you that, I explain that later, that we can use the same equation for a multi-cell tube, except because the section is not a single cell. Q is also variable. So we use the same equation, but Q remains inside the integral. Which I explain it later on a slide 15. The other thing that usually a student asks is, what is where the polar second moment of area is? For circular cylinders, we use a polar second moment of area in calculation of angle of twist and in calculation of the shear stress. When we have a thin wall section which has arbitrary shape, we do not have polar second moment of area. But if you look at the structure of this equation here, we have theta, if I just rearrange this equation, we have a theta equal to TL divided by 4A squared G, loop integral of DS over T. I can say this is working exactly the same as polar second moment of area. It is not polar second moment of area, but it is working exactly the same. It has the same unit as well. So this is G times the torsion constant here, which we use it here. It's not a repeat, it is not polar second moment of area, but it has the same unit and it does exactly the same job. Any question on the slide 14? Right? So let's solve the second part of this question. It was a single cell. We managed to find uh, the shear stress in each thickness. The next stage is find angle of twist of this section. So the red arrows is the constant shear flow applied to the section. Now we are after d theta over dz, theta over l, or theta, angle of twist, if I multiply by the length. So this is the equation for single cell tubes. Theta over L or D theta over DZ is equal to T divided by 4A squared loop integral of DS over GT. Or I can say it's equal to Q over 2A loop integral of DS over GT. If you remember, T is equal to 2AQ. So in this one, I've used it in terms of T. Some students prefer to use Q when they find Q. It's your choice. It doesn't make any difference. Now this is a loop integral of DSGT. The whole section is made of aluminium. It means I'm allowed to place G outside the integral because the whole section is made of the same material. But if you look at T, it's variable. So I'm not allowed to place T outside the integral. So first, I find this term. The torque applied, which is 100 kilonewton meters, multiplied by, I convert it to newton millimeters. I showed you how to find area enclosed by the perimeter, half a circle, rectangle, and triangle. And this is a G, which is the shear modulus. I've written it in, this is gigapascal. It's been given the description of the problem, G is equal to 30 gigapascal. So write it as a 30 times 10 to the power of three Newton per millimeter squared. So this is sorted. Now the next stage is finding this loop integral of ds over t. Thickness is variable, as you can see. I've attached the origin of the curve linear coordinate system at this location. Yes. This is what I'm doing now. Okay. So loop integral of ds over dt. As you can see, the Kerbelini coordinate system here attached at this location. What is actually ds? ds means if I start from here, 
this is the length of this panel. If I'm located, if the cursor is located at this position. So if I'm finding the loop integral of ds over gt, I have to go around this section. So I start from this point. And if I look at this panel, it has a thickness of 0.8 millimeters and the length of 1,000 millimeters. So the, for the loop integral of ds over t for this panel is equal to 1,000 divided by 0.8 millimeters. The next panel is again 1,000 here with the thickness of 0.4. So it's say 1,000 divided by 0.4. I go for the diagonal panel. I have 1,000 here. This is 400 here. So I can find this length. This is a tri right angle triangle. I can find this length. So it's that length divided by 0.4. The top panel again is 1,000 millimeters with a thickness of 0.8. And then we have a semicircle. So pi times 200 divided by 0.4 millimeters. So what you see inside this angle, right, angle bracket, these brackets are, is a loop integral of ds over t. Now if I do the integration, it gives me the rate of twist, radians per millimeter. Now if I'm after the angle of twist, what do I have to do with it? The length is given to me. I think it's 10 meters or 20 meters, you've got it in your description. What shall I do with this? This is a rate of twist. Shall I multiply it by the length or divide it by the length? This is the rate of twist. The angle of twist per unit length. Yes, please. Very good. So if I want to have angle of twist, I multiply it by the length to give me the rate of twist, the angle of twist. So the length is 10 meters, and the angle of twist is 10.06 degrees to quite high value. Wait, so, 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 where, so what's the uh, G and aluminium? G aluminium has been given in the description. If not, you need to refer to chapter one. Okay, if it's been given, G usually for aluminium is something between 26.9 and 30 gigapascals. And if I was asked to find the energy assured, I've got the angle of twist in radians, not in degrees. I multiply by T divided by 2. So thank you very much and see you in, now it's 8 minutes to 11. I see you at 11, please. Yes, aluminium. It's something between 26.9 and 27. G for aluminium. It's something between 26.8, 26.9, and 30, 31 gigapascals. Sometimes I've seen it 31, but 30 is the right value.
Say this is the ring. Yeah. It's it's stuck to the fuselage. Yeah. And the torque is applied. Yeah. So this is ten. Based on this, this is ten meters. So this is if yeah. my hand is the fuselage. Yeah. So this is ten meters. Yeah. And you are applying a torque. Yeah. You twist for about ten degrees, which is very yeah. high. At the very end, but you could equal it by anyone, and it would tell you the angle of twist at any point. That is a very good question. The whole thing twists for 10 degrees, yes. Okay, so it's... So it's fixed at one end. Ah, right. So this section, ro yeah. this section rotates 10, whatever, 10 degrees with respect to the variant. Yeah. But say so halfway along, that wall twists 10 degrees as well. Right? You need to refer to... I don't understand the question. <laughs> so say, so say, say if that's the wing. Okay. Okay, so it twists 10 degrees uh -huh. like this here. Okay. So where does it, how far does it twist here? Say so if you sliced it... And you the angle of twist is the same throughout. It twists the whole thing. Okay. But what is different is shear strain is different. Okay, yeah. I would have thought... And then you need to look at the slide number three. Yeah. I think I drew it for you, the shear strain. Yeah. Okay, that's... Intuitive, I would have thought. It doesn't really twist much at the fuselage. Yeah. And then it, it doesn't at all. It doesn't twist at all. Yeah, so then... It's a half way off. So what happens this time?
Oh, she's 11 now, please. I think I did this one, and that one. So one of the students had difficulty understanding this uh, equation. Uh, shall I briefly go through it again, please? So we have this equation giving us the angle of twist. It works exactly like T times L over GJ for a circular cylinder. So T is constant, A is the area enclosed by the perimeter is constant. The whole section is made of the same material, aluminium. So G is constant, can be, we are allowed to remove it from the integral, place it outside. So therefore the term here you see is equal to T divided by 4A squared G. So we've got T 100 kilonewton meters, 100 times 10 to the power of 6 gives us Newton millimeters. We've got the area enclosed by the perimeter I showed you earlier in the first hour, so it's a squared. And this is G, which is a 30 gigapascals. And in Newton per millimeter squared becomes 30 times 10 to the power of 3. So this is the constant term here, the coefficient. Now we move on to loop integral of ds over t. The thickness is allowed to vary based on the assumption we had. So you can see we have variable thicknesses. So ds, I've located the origin of the curvilinear coordinate system here. It doesn't make any difference where you put it. What is ds over t? ds is actually the length of the panel. So if I go from this, <coughs> I'm sorry, starting from this point, I'm finding this loop integral. I divide it to one, two, three, four, five sections. So I start from the section one on this curvilinear coordinate system. The length is 1,000 millimeters and the thickness is 0.8. So this is the first term. So this is for the first panel. The second panel, 1,000 divided by 0.4. As I said, I divided it to one, two, three, four, five pieces. So this is for the diagonal edge divided by its thickness to the top panel and the semicircular ones. Now the rest is just calculations. I add them up and multiply by that coefficient. It gives me the rate of twist, which is a radians per millimeter. The length is given 10 meters. So if I want to find the angle of twist, then I have to multiply it by 10. 10 times 1,000 because this is radian per millimeters. So in that case, I multiply it by 10. The answer is in radians. Then I convert it to degrees. This is a relatively very, very high value because it has no reinforcement. It's just a single cell section. Yes, please. L, again, is in the description of the problem. So it gives us, and if I was asked to find the energy stored, I have the angle of twist in radians. It multiplied by the torque, divided by two, it gives me the energy So You can see it's a high value because this, this structure is uh, large. As I said earlier, you can find the energy stored using that loop integral, but I would not, I don't recommend it. It's much, much easier if you have got angle of twist. Any questions? Did it answer the, one of the students asked me, did it answer the question? Okay. So we move on to, before I move on to a slide 15, finding the angle of twist and shear stress of a multi-cell tube subject to a torque. So I go through the slide number 20. I say it's a reviewer slide, something you should already know. However, I just briefly go through it. Based on whatever I show you on the slide 20, I show you the equations on the slide 15. On this slide, you see an aluminum bar, a copper bar, 
and a steel bar, they all attached and placed between two walls. So it's, they are fixed to the left wall, and then we apply a force to the right wall. Say when we apply the force, the right wall moves to the right and it doesn't become, I mean, it remains straight and it doesn't become oblique, diagonal. So it remains straight, vertical. So I'm applying a force to the right wall. The left one is completely rigid and I move it to the right with the displacement of delta. But the three bars are made of different materials. They have different cross-sectional areas. So when they're all moving with the same extension, I mean, they have, they're extended the same for the same value, they could not have the same internal force applied to them. This is based on the theory you learned in chapter one. Delta is equal to Fn over Ae. They have different Young's modulus. They have different cross-sectional areas, so they cannot have the same internal force applied to them. So they all move with the same distance, but they are subject to, <coughs> sorry, they are subject to different internal forces. Now, based on what you already know, equilibrium, we use equilibrium equation to relating F to these three internal forces. F is equal to the summation of the internal forces, R1, R2, and R3. But this equation at the moment, we have three unknowns. We have R1, R2, and R3. So one equilibrium equation, we cannot solve this problem. There are different, we can use energy methods to analyze it, but at the moment, the equations we could use are these three equations here. Based on these three equations here, and combining it with the equilibrium, we can solve the problem. So the bottom one is called equilibrium. The top one is called compatibility. It means the whole, the three bars at the moment act like a system, they work together. They have the same displacement. So using the compatibility equations by summating these two, these two together, and combining it with equilibrium, we can easily find the internal forces. Now say we've got a section, a multi-cell section subject to a torque, very similar to what you see on the top. When we apply the torque, each of these little cells has got its own resisting torque. They have different thicknesses. They, have, they may be made of different materials, similar to what you see on the top, very similar. So they, each one of them has got resistant torque. We call it T1, T2, T3, like R1, R2, R3. So based on the equilibrium, I can say the external torque is equal to the summation of these smaller resisting torques. But, because they're all rotating with the same angular twist, so when they apply the torque, all three work as one system. Based on the compatibility, they, work, they have the same angular twist, similar to what you have on the top. So we call it a compatibility of the system. And the bottom one, is equilibrium of the external torque to the resisting torques from the three or n cells we have. So if I just use the equilibrium equation, I cannot solve this problem because I have too many unknowns. I have T1, T2, T3 unknown. I also have a theta one, theta two, theta three, or theta unknown. So by combining the compatibility equation and the equilibrium, now I can solve the problem. Similar, exactly the same as the top one. Any question on slide 20? This is just a review of slide. So we move on to a slide 15. So I've got a multi-cell tube. It's made of N cells. So you see that's three cells, but say it's got many cells. 
The tour card is applied uh, above the shear center. So I have put it on the side because I didn't want to make the figure crowded. So this T is applied above the shear center, somewhere here. The shear center is somewhere here. And the concept of shear center is going to be covered in chapter five. Now, each of these cells has got its own area. Area includes by its perimeter, A1, A2, A3, AN. Now, when I apply this torque, there will be shear flows in each of these cells. But because the thickness is varied, and also the areas are different, the shear flows cannot be the same. But they're all in the same direction as the torque applied. So when I apply this torque, all these uh, shear flows are in the same direction of the applied torque. So each one of them has got its own resist, has got its own shear flow, and also has got its own uh, resistant torque. So for a single cell, they said 2AQ was equal to 2T, torque applied. Now here I can say each of them has got its own shear flow. I can say two times the area of each of those cells multiplied by the shear flow of each of those cells is the resisting torque of each of that cell. So I can say to AQ, to A1Q1 is a resisting torque of the cell number one. To A2Q2 is a resisting torque from the number two, cell number two. And this is for cell number three and so on. So the torque, the external torque is, is the equal to the summation of these resisting torques. Or I can write it as equal to summation of number of cells, two A, I, Q, I. So at the moment, what you see on this, this equation is equilibrium. We have so many unknowns, we cannot just use equilibrium equation to solve it. We're going to add compatibility equation to the equilibrium equation to have enough equation to solve the problem. So the whole section is rotating with the same angle of twist. So that it has the same rate of twist. We assume it's a wing of an aircraft, for example, is tapered. Based on this equation, we assume it's uniform, has a uniform area along its length. So when we are analyzing it, usually students say, is this a tapered? No, it's not tapered. In the analysis of theories of torsion, we assume cross-sectional area is uniform along its length. So if you're analyzing a wing of an aircraft or any other structures which is tapered, you need to use the effective area for analysis. So the angle of twist is the same for all of them. Now we find the angle of twist for a typical cell. And this is what we found for a single cell. For a single cell, I wrote d theta over dz equal to t over 4a squared loop integral of ds over gt. I cannot do it here. So t, you cannot see the sign of t here. I cannot use that equation. Okay. I substitute t equal to 2aq and put q outside the integral. Again, that is not applicable because q is variable. So look at the construction of this equation. This is not the same, you can use this for single cell and then move q outside the integral. But it's not, you cannot uh, do it other way around. So look at the construction of this equation. For a typical cell, we've got one over 2a, Q is inside the integral, not T. You don't see any sign of T. Divided by GT, we allow G and T varying, and DS. So this is the angle of twist for each of these cells. So if I write these equations and combine it with the top one, now I can solve the problem. But how do we write it for one cell? Say so starting for the middle cell. The middle cell has a shear flow of QI. So it could be any of them, it doesn't make any difference. Now I'm going to write this equation for the middle cell <coughs> in this case. So d theta over dz is equal to, C 
similar to what we did for the wing section earlier, for the single cell one. For this one, I say 1 over 2a, 1, the area of the cell. So 1 over 2ai, which is the area of the cell. Now I'm going to find around, I go around this section, say the origin of the Kirby linear coordinate system is here for this cell. Now I'm finding QDS multiplied by GT. Say the top one, 1, 2, is made of a material, the shear modulus of G, 1, 2. The thickness of 1, 2 as well, so GT is sorted. Now we move on to the top. What is DS? It's starting from this point and ending up at that point. It's the length of the panel. So I write it at S12 or length of the panel 12. What is the shear flow in panel 12? It's the shear flow here. So if you look at the shear flow, panel 12 is subject to a shear flow of QI. So QY, S12 divided by G12, T12 gives me this integral for panel 12. Now I move on to panel two, three. I just repeat it. The length of this panel, S23, the thickness, T23, the shear modulus of G23. Well, what is shear flow in this panel? If you have a shear flow of QI here, and we've got a shear flow of QI minus one in the next panel, in the next cell. So therefore the shear flow in this panel is the difference between these two. So in this cell, this is, for, I'm writing this equation for the middle cell. In the middle cell, this is the positive direction. So I start from panel one, two, I did that, then I move on to panel two, three. So G two, three, T two, three, S two, three, two, three. So the only difference is the, diff, the shear flow panel 2, 3, which is the difference between these two. This is going this way. This is going that way in the opposite direction of this sign. So it's going to end up with negative sign. Now we move on to the next panel. 3, 4. 3, 4 is very similar to 1, 2. The, neck, the it's, other side of it is free end. This is free as well. And for this one, we've got, again, this is positive. It considered as negative. It's in the opposite direction. So this is the shear flow in the vertical panel, 1, 4. The length of the panel, 1, 4. The shear modulus and the thickness. Any questions regarding what I've written here for you? So once I write this, I do it for all the cells, and using this compatibility equation, I can just find all the unknowns for the problem. So if I was given this problem to solve, I usually get, a, say, a multi-cell section. I have the geometry, I have the material properties. So I have the, the torque applied. So the angle of twist is unknown. The shear flows are unknown. So therefore, I have the shear flows. So I have three cells that have three unknown shear flows. The angle of twist is the same for all of them. So the angle of twist is unknown. So I have four unknowns for a three cell tube. So this is one equation. I use it three times. So one plus three gives me four equations. So from there, I can solve the problem. This is exactly the text I've written for you here. Just remember, it's not just shear flows which are unknown. Angle of twist is also unknown, or the rate of twist is unknown. The summation gives me... Now, the total energy, you can find the energy stored in each of those cells and just add them up. I don't recommend it. I've never done it myself because it's just a waste of your time. Once you've got the angle of twist, you can easily multiply it by the torque divided by two, but angle of twist must be in radians. Any question in relation to slide number 15?
Okay? So let's solve the remaining part of uh, question 11, please, based on whatever you see on the slide 15. So first we started with a single cell tube. Then we found, we found it's a shear stress in each thickness. First we found the shear flow, then shear stress in each thickness. And for a single cell, we found the angle of twist. So the last part of the question is saying that if I've got a, I think in this figure the dashed line is missing. So I, in the last part, I'm asking you to find uh, the angle of twist and the shear stress in each thickness. If we have reinforced this structure by adding a vertical wall in the dotted position, I think your dotted position is not added to the figure. So if I add a reinforcement here, so instead of having a single cell, we can change it to a double cell tube. So we added a one millimeter thick wall to the ring to make it, to reinforce it. Now here we've got now double cell. So I say on the left hand side, the area is A1, on the right hand side is A2. So each one of them has got its own shear flow. So the torque applied, usually the two shear flows are in the same direction as the torque applied. So the first equation we have is the equilibrium. The torque applied is equal to 2A1Q1 plus 2A2Q2. 2A1Q1 is the resisting torque from cell number one. 2A2Q2 is the resisting torque from cell number two. So this is equilibrium of the torques. Now we've got at the moment three unknowns, Q1, Q2, and the angle of twist. So we need compatibility equation. Now here I've just substituted the values. A1 is the area of a half a circle, area of a rect rectangle. A2 is just a triangle. So I've substituted the values, so it gives me one equation. Now the angle of twist of cell number one is equal to the angle of twist of cell number two. We start with the, the first one, d theta over dz for cell number one. So this is the equation, one over two a one, q remains inside the integral times ds, shear modulus multiplied by t. The whole section is made of the same material. Am I allowed to move g outside? Yes, good. So I move g outside. So I have one over two a g multiplied by loop integral of ds over t. Now what is loop integral of q ds over t? So we start with this panel. What is the shear flow in this panel? If the whole section, the whole cell has a shear flow of Q1, what is the shear flow in this panel? Yes? Q1. Q1. What about the top one? Okay. What about, I'm not asking you anymore. <laughs> what is the shear flow in this one? Q1. What is the shear flow in this one? Is it Q1 minus Q2 or Q2 minus Q1? Okay, Q1 minus Q2, if you're Q1 minus Q2, Q1 minus Q2, Q1 minus Q2, absolutely correct. So, so I have divided it to one, two, three, four subsections. You agree that thousand millimeter length panel and the top one have the same shear flow active applied to them. So what I've done here, I've multiplied one of them by two. 
So this is, if you're taking notes, you can say this is 1,000 plus 1,000 multiplied by Q1 divided by the thickness of 0.8. Are you happy with that? Now I move on to the semicircular one. Pi R, which is, the radius is 200, pi R multiplied by the shear flow Q1 divided by its thickness. And for the vertical panel, is we are inside Q cell number one, so the positive direction is this direction. So therefore it makes it Q1 minus Q2. The thickness is one, and the length is, this is 200, so this is 400. So it gives us the first equation for the angle of twist of cell number one. I'm going to repeat it for cell number two. What is the shear flow applied to the, this panel? Q2, this one, Q2, and this one? Very good, Q2 minus Q1. So this is the angle of twist, rate of twist of the second one. This is the first one, the second one, and this is Q2 minus Q1. <coughs> now I'm going to equate these two equations. These two must be equal because of compatibility of the system. So these two are the same. If I equate these two, it gives me an equation in terms of Q1 and Q2. So Q1 is 2.47 times than Q2 because it's a larger cell. Usually it's bigger if they have the same material. Now I've got one equation here, one equation there. I'm going to combine these two and I find the shear flow in each cell. Now if I was asked to find the shear stress, maximum shear stress, I have to do it by inspection. Sometimes the thinnest section is not necessarily subject to maximum shear stress. Depends on the shear flow applied in that cell. So now I've just find the shear stress in each, at the moment the maximum is 230 megapascals. The angle of twist has been reduced. You can see that when we add the reinforcement here, we have reduced it from 10 something to 8 point something degrees. So if you add another reinforcement here, obviously make a three cell tube. I think an example in Mexican, you can find the three cell tube, the complete solution is there. A three cell tube, you can see we can reduce it even lower than 8.818 degrees. So as I said, the maximum shear stress must be obtained by inspection. <coughs> The thinnest section is not necessarily subject to the maximum shear stress. Any question in, re in regard to this example? Yes, please. What does it mean by inspection? By well, inspection means that when you find the shear flows, you need to go one by one for each panel to divide Q and the T value to find the shear stress and compare them. For a single cell, we don't need to do that because they're all subject to the same shear flow. So we just find the thinner section and then Q divided by that thinner section give us the maximum shear stress. So when I say by inspection means that if you see the thinnest section, it doesn't mean it's always subject to the maximum shear stress. Does it answer the question? Yes, so, the, so, the, so the max shear stress is found by cell with maximum Q divided by Yes, and then you need to do it for each cell, and then you find out and compare them, and then find the max, maximum shear stress. Yes. Any other questions in relation to this example? Okay. Yes. Yes, please.
That is a very good question. When you're writing this equation here, whichever cell you are, as I said, when you apply a torque, all three shear flows, four shear flows, whatever, are in the same direction of the applied torque. Now, when you're in cell number one, this is considered as your positive sign. So when you're writing the equation, this is positive. Therefore, when it, in the other direction, it becomes negative. Now, when you're in cell number two, this is your positive direction. Therefore, for this cell, Q2 becomes positive. This is in the opposite direction. So this is coming, as you can see, I've drawn it for you. So this is coming downward Q2 for this, when you're in this cell. This is coming downwards, and this is going upwards. So therefore, when you're in this cell, this becomes for you negative. Does it answer the question? So if within the cell, this direction is positive, you write it, all the equations according to that direction being positive. Okay, now let's, <coughs> <coughs> sorry. So let's move on to solving question number nine. It's a tail section, it's a simplified version of a tail section. The difference between this question and the previous question is that everything is the same, except we're going to use different materials for the second part of question number nine. Other than that, they're very, very similar. So in question number nine, <coughs> we have a single cell. The, cross the dimensions are given, and the value of the torque is given, which is 50 kilonewton meters. And the first part is asking us to find the shear stress in each thickness. And finding the strain energy stored, angle of twist. And then in the second part of this question, it's asking us, say the material is not, the whole section is not made of the same material. Say the vertical walls are made of, say, steel or titanium, a different material. Then find the angle of twist and also the maximum and minimum shear stresses. So we started with section part A of question number nine, which is very similar to the first two parts of question 11. So we have the torque applied. The length is five meters. The problem is asking us to find the shear stress in its thickness, the angle of twist, and the energy stored, assuming the whole section is made of aluminium with a shear modulus of 30 gigapascals. So in this case, we have the torque. The torque is equal to two times the area enclosed by the perimeter multiplied by the shear flow. It's a single cell. Shall we assume shear flow is constant around the section? Yes. So T is equal to 2AQ, and if I'm after shear stress, I need to find the shear flow. So shear flow is equal to T divided by two times area of the region enclosed by the perimeter. The area of the perimeter, A, can be obtained by addition, by, uh, by adding, by the summation of the area of these two trapeziums. You've got one trapezium here, and you have another trapezium here. So here I just say, the summation of the areas of the two trapeziums is equal to this value. You do it in your own time. So Q is equal to T divided by 2A. So we've got 50 kilonewton meters. I've converted it to newton millimeters divided by two times area. It gives us this value. Would you write down the solution for shear stress? <coughs> <coughs> Could you write down the solution for shear stress, please?
So we have a thickness of uh, six millimeters, a thickness of two millimeters, and a thickness of four millimeters. So which one subject to the maximum shear stress? Two, four, or six? Two. Very good. So in order to find the shear stress, I divide the shear flow by thickness of each panel. So this is the first one. This is the second one, and this is the third one. So obviously, for a single cell subject to a torque, shear flow is constant. We get the maximum shear stress on the thinner section. Now we move on to the angle of twist. In this equation, shear flow is constant. So I place Q outside the integral. If it was a multi-cell, Q remains inside the integral. It's made of the same material, so I have moved G outside the integral as well. So the loop integral of ds over t must be calculated. I have placed the origin of the Kelvin linear coordinate system somewhere here. You can place it here as well. I put it on this point here. For this uh, chapter, a five, my advice here, it doesn't make any difference. For chapter five, it's easier to put it at the open end, but in this is a closed section anyway. Now, starting from this point, DST, we have the length of the panel divided by its thickness. We've got two of them, which are the same. It's got an one axis of symmetry. Then we've got another two panels, which are the same, with the same thickness, and two vertical ones, which are equal as well. So this is the X, this coefficient Q divided by two times area multiplied by G. You can either for a single cell using Q divided by 2AG or T over 4A squared, whichever you're comfortable with. Majority of the students use, sometimes, you, I, mean, I can't say majority, some students use this one, some students use the other ones. It's just exactly the same. So I find the look integral of DS. So we've got two panels of S12 and 65 are the same. So two times S12 divided by the thickness of 12. S23 divided by its thickness. We've got two of them. Plus two S34 divided by the thickness of 34. So what you see here is this loop integral. So this is a, this coefficient. And this is this loop integral. The answer is 15.34 times 10 to the power of minus 6 radians per millimeter. In order to find the angle of twist, we multiply it by how many meters? 5 meters. But just remember, this is a millimeter. So this must be converted to millimeters. Or you can convert it to meter, your choice. And then, I haven't shown the value of theta here, but I've done, given you the final answer. So whatever you get here, multiply it in radians, multiply by L, then multiply it by T, divide by 2, gives you 1.9 kilojoules. The energy is stored in the section. Any question in relation to this slide, please? Now, in the second part of this question, it is a still single cell. I didn't make it a multi-cell. I wanted to keep it slightly easier. So it is a still single cell, but the two vertical walls are made of a different material. So at the moment, the whole section is made of aluminium. Now in the second part, the vertical walls are made of steel. Now if they are made of steel, do we get the same shear flow or we don't get the same shear flow? Do 
we get the same shift or we don't get the same shift if I have different materials for the vertical panels. Yes, please. There will be the same shift though. That's very good. It's the same shift flow. T is equal to 2AQ. It does not depend on the material property. So we get exactly the same values for shear stresses. We haven't changed the shape of the geometry. A hasn't changed. So T is equal to 2AQ. The material property doesn't exist there. When it comes to the stiffness of the material, that's when we use material properties. The deformation, we need material properties. For stress, we need for a strophic and homogeneous material, typical of metals. When you calculate the stresses, you don't need material properties. You just need the force applied and the geometry. So the shear stress remains the same. Now let's go for the angle of twist. Is this the right thing to do at the moment? Is this correct what I've done here? That is correct. So this is not correct. G must have been inside the integral. So this is not right. I should lose some marks here. So G should remain, as I said on purpose, so G must remain inside the integral. So here we are going to just keep Q and A out of the integral, but we need to keep G and T inside the integral. So look at the equation now. I'm calculating the loop integral of ds over gt. So we've got two panels of R1, 2, both made of aluminium. So two times the length of the panel, the thickness of each panel, and this is the shear modulus of aluminium. We've got two, three, and five, four, five, the same material, the same length. So this is for these two. Now look at these two. Now we've got two times the length of panel three, four, or one, six, the thickness and shear modulus. The shear modulus of a steel is 85. So the material has become a stiffer. Do we expect to get a lower strain energy stored or a higher strain energy stored? If a material is stiffer, does it store more energy or less energy? How many of you think it's less? Do you think it's less? Any more, less? How many of you think it's more? So it, when it becomes stiffer, then it stores less energy. I don't know if they've calculated it here or not. So it, I mean, the energy stored is lower. It's 1.79, I think the other one was 1.80 something. So the stiffer the material is, the low energy it stores, the more flexible it is, like elastic band, it's more flexible. It stores more energy. So this example, it's a still single cell, but it just shows you how to um, see the effect of material property in the equation. So whenever you see the material property, so this equation I've written here cannot be right. So this is not correct. It has to be here. Any questions? So I don't think we have time for this one today, uh, but this is what we are going, <coughs> I'm going to do it uh, in the first hour of uh, next Monday, and then we, when I finish this part, and then I solve a few examples, and then um, we move on to the theories of bending. So it's quarter to 12. Would you like to stop now, or shall I solve an example for you? It's your choice. How many of you would like to leave now? You've had enough of me. 
you've had enough of me. How many of you would like to solve an example? So the majority want to solve it, so you should stay here as well. Okay. Okay. See you. Thank you very much. And see you on Monday next week. Thank you. Thank <laughs> you. 